Okay, so I want to explore uh, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 today. Um, it's the end of chapter 5, and, and we're going we're gonna to dive into this scripture um, with a story. Uh, I'm going to start out with a story. He sat down for dinner at a fancy Boston restaurant. Exhausted from the red-eye flight he took with only an hour nap to regain the rest he lost on the plane. After all, how's a six-foot-three guy supposed to sleep on a plane? Although he was tired, he was happy to visit his only daughter. He hadn't seen her face-to-face -face since the previous Christmas, and this was going to be a great time. But he also knew that she had asked him to come, and there was a clear purpose to this visit. He looked across the table at the young man that, the, that his daughter had called boyfriend and knew there was something more going on with this visit. He seemed like a nice enough guy, but his first impression with his wife a few months earlier was, well, subpar at best. A few months before, this gentleman's wife had come to visit their only daughter in Boston and met this young man, but it was a rocky point in their relationship. And as much as the young couple tried to make the visit normal, it was anything but. And the mother had left Boston wondering what her daughter saw in that jerk. Actually, some of the words that she used to correctly describe this young man was some of the most colorful language that this lifelong Christian woman had ever used. And they were accurate. It was, it, it was exactly what he was during their visit. He made it easy for her to understand why West Coast people ha have such an easy time thinking East Coast people are jerks. But this was a new time, and the father wanted to make his own judgment on this young Bostonian. This young man knew that it was important to make a good impression and make up for the first interaction he had with this, this couple and make a good impression for the daughter's new guy. As the young man looked across the table, he saw a man of big stature, six foot three, an old collegiate football player in his mid 50s. He was still intimidating in size. However, his eyes were kind and his smile was sweet. It helped the young man's worries to rest for just a moment. The father had taken time away from work and traveled 3,000 miles on an overnight flight for a purpose. He was there to meet the young man that would ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. The plan was for the young man to ask the older gentleman for his blessing. But that all got thrown out when the father made a really awkward statement. The statement began, my five-year plan is. And the young man looked at the older gentleman and said, this was a time for us to come together and have the young people have a five-year plan, not, not the old people have a five-year plan. This isn't how it's supposed to work. But thankfully, the young man was wise enough to keep his mouth shut. My five-year plan is for you and my daughter to get married and provide my wife and I with some grandkids. And at that point, the young couple choked on the appetizers they were eating. <laughs> the dad continued, as long as you, and he stared at the young man right in the face, right in the eye, and he said, as long as you can answer a question for me. The young man began to sweat. The mental tennis match had just started, and the only thing the younger had to his advantage was his youth. Although this discussion was taking place at the young man's home of Boston, the elder clearly was the favorite in this conversation. Only having known this man for a couple hours, it was difficult for the young person to know what the question was going to be. And it had him really uncomfortable. He wanted to know every answer he could give this old man. This was my first encounter with the man who would be my father-in-law. He had asked the question and was waiting patiently for the answer. The question he asked was, will you love my daughter the same way I've loved my wife. I contemplated the question for a moment and I responded. I only met Kathy for a couple days a few months ago, and I only met you a couple hours ago. I haven't seen you two together, and I don't understand at all the dynamic between you two. So as much as I would like to say yes to this question, I think that would be disingenuous. What an answer, I thought to myself. Instead of getting tangled up in the web of their relationship, I made every politician proud by stepping squarely out of the way of that question and avoiding a question I thought sure was to trip me up. He heard my answer and stayed silent for a moment. My girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, watched the conversation like it was a tennis match, her eyes darting back and forth between hits, wondering 
which one of us would hit the ball out of bounds, or, or even more exciting, who's going to make the kill shot? <laughs> My father in law continued to stare at me, and, and then he spoke. He said, that's a very thoughtful answer. After all, how could you know the relationship I, I've had with my wife? You've never seen us in the same room. There it was. The score goes to the young man. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, the match was far from over. The gears in the older man's brain were turning, and the older started to ask another question. His question this time was, can you love my daughter the way Jesus Christ loves the church? There it was. Point, set, match. At that point, I saw something I had never seen before. When my father-in-law talked about Jesus, it was, it was like he was talking about someone he knew. It's like he was talking about someone he personally knew and had an intimate, personal relationship with. Even though I was not a follower of Jesus at that point, I would have called myself a Christian. If there was a, if there was a questionnaire, I would have checked off the box that said Christian. But it was the first time I had met someone who referred to Jesus as a personal friend. Referred to Jesus as someone who had influence over his life and his marriage. It was the first genuine Christian man I had noticed in my adult life. That's not to say that I hadn't come across him before, but I hadn't noticed it. See, I was really good at talking my way into good positions and out of bad positions. I had my conversations with people that I was able to build strong relationships, and they weren't always genuine relationships, but I cut what I wanted out of the relationship. I prided myself on the way I was able to work through conversations, but this conversation felt different. This conversation was very different. I couldn't put my finger on it at the time. It felt like there was someone else present in our conversation. It wasn't just the three of us, but, but someone else was there, whose presence was felt but unknown. I didn't know what it was, but I felt the need to be totally open and honest in my reply to the question. I told him, all I can tell you is I'll try. I didn't know the gravity of my statement I had made that day. I had no idea how much Christ loved the church. I mean, I knew that Christ had died for the church, but to me it was more like a fairy tale. It wasn't the truth that I now find my salvation in. It wasn't the truth of my worldview. It was a fairy tale. And I share this for so many reasons. But this reason is why it burned into my memory today and why I share it today. It helped me understand what the meaning of marriage was. Marriage, to say the least for me, was strained. In my immediate family, my mom, my dad who I've never met, and my only brother, I've seen eight marriages come and fail. I've seen six other engagements come and never get to marriage. I know it's true that no one wants to go through a divorce, but my experience up to that point was really when the road gets rough, you file for divorce. That's what you do. That's the easiest thing to do. And and the analogy that I was given on that cold Boston night was different. It was that marriage between a man and a woman is like the relationship between Christ and the church. And Christ has never abandoned the church. Christ has never not loved the church. And if I'm honest, that night, it freaking blew my mind. <laughs> the passage we're studying today is it's one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. It's been spoken at millions of weddings worldwide. But the truth is that this passage is so much more than just scripture for a young couple getting hitched. It's a passage we can look at and can speak to every man and every woman with ears to hear. We're finishing up chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians in our series called Unity. Next week you'll hear from Kelly Jones when he talks about kids, but this week we get to dive in and explore the timeless truth that God has designed for our marriage and how that affects each and every one of us. So let's go ahead and hop into it. And as has been the case for all of chapter 5, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. I want to be consistent to the, to the scriptures as we go through it. So if you have a Bible app, go ahead and choose ESV as the version to follow along with me. The words will be on the screen as well. If you have a paper Bible, feel free to follow along and, and do some comparisons between what your translation says and what this translation says, and ultimately they should say the same thing because they both go back to the original language. But let's read through this passage together. It's, it's a lengthy passage, and it's heavy, but it's worth our diving into. And here's what it says, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, 
his body and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, Paul says, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is a heavy passage. And as I go over these three points today about this passage written almost 2,000 years ago and how it speaks to us in 2020, I want to make an important disclaimer. I want you to know that I'm not talking at you but with you. Although I'm standing and you're sitting, I want you to imagine us sitting around a table or, or in, a, in a living room just having this discussion. Because I know that this whole marriage thing, it's a work in progress. And if I'm honest, me as a husband, I'm a work in progress too. So what I've decided to do in this time we have here, because it's so heavy, is I want to explore three points with you today. And I want to dive into those three points, but we're not going to have time to dive as deeply as I want to in these three points. So throughout this week, I'm going to send out emails to people on our email list further exploring these topics. So if you want to be sure to continue this conversation and you're not on our email list, go ahead and fill out a connection card. You can do that online or you can do it with the yellow piece of paper that we have in the building. But if you want to continue this conversation with this topic, please make sure you get on our email list and we can continue that conversation. And with these emails, if there's something you want to discuss or reply to, I encourage you to push that reply button. Let's have a conversation. We at Compass, the pastors at Compass, the ministry at Compass, wants to have this conversation as we move forward with what this passage means to us today. The three points I want to explore today are these. Mutual submission, self-worth, and non-married peoples. Those are the three points I want to make today. And all of these come together, if done with integrity, to represent Jesus Christ. The first topic, mutual submission. And when I get to officiate a wedding, which I love to do, I love to look at the, the young love in their eyes and the excitement in, in, in their lives, just looking forward to spending the rest of their lives together. And sometimes you can mistake that for fear. Maybe it's not a mistake, but whatever. <laughs> fear, happiness, love, it all looks the same in your eyes. So when I get to officiate a wedding, I'm sure to include this passage because it's, it's a topic that Paul brings up that our culture has forgotten. Most, most theologians call what Paul's talking about here as mutual submission. It's mutual submission. The beginning of this passage starts in a way that causes people in our culture to get defensive and ultimately turn against the timeless wisdom of this passage. And, and here at Compass, we take God's word seriously. We, we want to make sure that we don't skip over passages that may be difficult. We don't skip over passages that may be hard to talk about. And this is one of those passages that, that is difficult to talk about in our culture, but it's important. And we're going to dive into it. We're not going to skip over it. And, and, and instead, we're going to dive into this and see the wisdom that God shares with us through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The first sentence here, the first verse, is so complex and so deep, and yet... It's really only ten, ten words. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Those ten words are really important. And the whole verse is important. And I stress the word whole because oftentimes, whether we mean to or not, we, we take bits and pieces of, of verses or passages and, and, and we apply only parts of it to our lives. Or we dismiss parts of it. And we forget to take the whole thing as it is, and that's human nature. That's, that's the way we operate sometimes. We, we take something and it helps us affirm an already 
held belief we have, or we can take something, part of it, and dismiss it because we want to deny it more easily. But, but this verse of taken as whole is so much different than what our culture might think it is. People sometimes hear wives submit to your own husbands, and they neglect to hear the, wet, the rest. Those last four words are important. And it actually lays out the how and the boundaries to that submission. As to the Lord are those last four words. And it's really important that we remember that those words are important there. They finish the sentence. It tells us that there is a head of the household. And it tells us that there is a responsibility that the husband must live up to. And because both men and women are amago Dei, they are created in the image of God, as Genesis 1.27 tells us, they are equal in value. So men are to accept the responsibility of being a godly husband and, and treat his wife in a godly manner, not asking or demanding her to do anything outside of the will of God. That's important. The Bible is also not telling us here that, that husbands have free reign to dominate or abuse or control or dictate or, or be a tyrant. And it doesn't mean that wives shouldn't express themselves freely or think independently or not cooperate in the decision-making in terms of the couple or the family. It's not saying that. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 talks about mutual submission. Husbands and wives are to live in an attitude of humility and service to one another. Together, as two individuals that came together as one flesh, they are to live together in submission to Jesus Christ. That's how a marriage in, in the Christian sense is supposed to work. And in our culture, we think the word submission is a negative thing. We look at it as a negative thing. And this is one of the lies that the devil has been so successful in pushing forward in our day and age. That submission equals weakness or sets us up in tiers of value. If one submits to someone else, their value is lower. In this passage, the word submit or submission is, is one with a positive sense. When the husband willingly submits to the authority of Jesus Christ, the husband looks at his wife the same way that Jesus looks at his bride, the church. And the actions there should line up with the way Jesus treats his church and continues to treat his church. When mutual submission exists in a marriage and it's, it's, it's practiced regularly, that marriage embodies the humble servanthood that exemplifies Jesus Christ and, and glorifies God. That's why marriage was created by God, to glorify Him. It's a covenant agreement that two people come together and put Jesus first and submit to His will, and in that it glorifies God. That's why we were created. This idea of submission, that it doesn't lessen value, is also consistent with God and His triune nature. And that's just a Christianese word to say that God exists in three separate yet connected people. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And although these three entities are equal in all ways, they're, they're, they're different. And Jesus willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father when he chose to come down here, be born into this world, and die a sinner's death. That's an example of what submit, submission looks like without lessening value. Jesus wasn't less in value to the Father or the Holy Spirit, but he chose to submit himself to the will of the Father. And when, when talking about this passage, there's a pastor from the late 1600s, early 1700s, that has a great quote with the importance and the value of men and women. In a time that was still really patriarchal, Matthew Henry, an author and minister, said this, The woman was made from Adam's side. She was not made from his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. I read this, and it reminds me that we were both made in God's image, and we are both of great importance. My wife and I went on a walk last, last evening in the gorgeous October afternoon, sunshine, and and as we were walking and talking, and, and I was talking to her about this, this talk, and I thought, hey, if, if I'm sharing about husbands and wives, I, I, I better include my wife in this discussion. So as, as we're walking and talking, she asked a question that floored me. And this was the question. 
What are your thoughts for women whose husbands don't follow Jesus? And I thought to myself, that's a darn good question. There are many people I know who, who I would consider spiritually single, meaning that the, the woman chooses to follow after Jesus, but the man doesn't. And so what do you do in that situation? Should women submit to their husbands in that situation? And the answer is yes, as long as it doesn't conflict with your following Jesus or God's will. I've known many men who don't follow Jesus that are great husbands. I've known many men who claim to follow Jesus that are, that are crummy husbands. But really what we should be doing for each other, male and female, husband and wife, is we should be praying for one another that we can each choose to follow after God's will and put our life into Jesus' hands. So the answer to that question, which is a complex question, is yes, as long as it does not interfere with the will of Jesus Christ. The second point I want to talk about today is self-worth. And it seems like a weird thing to talk about here. And, and to be honest, as, as I researched this, I couldn't find much commentary on this, but it struck me. And I want to read 25 through 30 real quick and then talk about what struck me here. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. And as I read this passage and meditated and prayed about it and, 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 and prayed out loud to God, God, what do you want me to say about this? It struck me that this passage was written to a totally different culture. Now that doesn't, doesn't mean it doesn't apply to our culture in 2020, but it's important to understand the cultural context that this passage is shared in. Not a culture that's hyper-connected through technology. Not a culture that has been hit hard in the same way we've been hit hard when it comes to mental health. Not a culture in the age of coronavirus where so many areas of our lives are virtual instead of real. Most kids here are going to school virtually. Adults are transitioning to working from home, a.k.a working virtually. Many churches haven't opened up yet, and they're trying to do their best to figure out how to do this community thing in a virtual setting. So our culture is a little bit different than, than the Ephesian church. That doesn't mean that mental health concerns didn't exist then, but they're different now. A few years ago, I found myself in the middle of a professional development situation. I was, I was getting my administration credentials, and and I was reading this book and studying this book called iGen. It was a study of the generation that comes after millennials. The generation defined as always having smartphones in their possession their entire life. And the, the, the author of this book, Jane Twenge, who's a, who's a research professor working out of the San Diego State University, came to Bend. She came to Bend and I had an opportunity to go and hear her speak. Well, she conducted this longevity study looking at the effects of technology over many years in the minds of a lot of our young people. And there were three quotes that as I was thinking and praying and meditating on this that popped into mind from that book. First one is, all in all, in-person social interaction is much better for mental health than electronic communication. And as we read that, we might think to ourselves, well, duh. But how often do we just pick up a phone instead of talking to somebody in real life? It's easy to do, but it's also unhealthy to do. The second quote that popped into my mind was another study, because she's referencing another study, and although this book dealt with generations of iGen, which is, which is now our current middle school through college, and even though the study looked at that, she said another study of adults found the same thing. The more people use Facebook, the lower their mental health and life satisfaction with the next assessment. And so it's not just a kid situation, it's a people situation. And finally, this one really struck me. iGen, that generation that is now from middle school through college, iGen is on the verge of the most severe mental health crisis for young people in decades. On the surface, though, 
everything is fine. And I stress that because we, we are really good at making up two identities for ourselves. The hurting, the broken identity, and then the identity we put on social media. The identity that makes everyone look like we've got it all together. That there's nothing wrong with us. That we're not struggling in any way. This book was published a few years ago, and, and the people that she studied are now entering into the age of marriage, where, where people typically think about getting married. And so, as I was thinking about this, that's why I was struck so much with verse 29 and 30. Verse 29 and 30 talks about a man loving his wife like he loves himself, for a man's never hated his own flesh. We live in a time where one of the most uti utilized tools is technology. And please don't get me wrong, I love technology. I love getting the latest gadgets. Actually, Hillary got a call from one of our friends this week that asked, is, did Matt buy the iPhone 12 yet? And Hillary said, no, he's grounded. <laughs> I am. But I love new technology. And I think technology is something that people can use for good or people can use for bad. It's just a tool. Unfortunately, that same tool can be used by the devil, and he doesn't ever use it for good. He only uses it for bad. He only uses it to tear people down. That's his motive. That's what he does. And I promise you, in my time, when I've been working with youth for 20 years, since, since the year 2000 when I graduated college, I've seen that the mental health crisis has grown. I've seen young people's mental health lessened and deteriorated. It's true. When Paul penned this letter to the Ephesians, times were very different than today. And again, that isn't to say that mental health concerns didn't exist back then. I'm certain they did. But it is to say that the culture we live in today lends itself better to people hiding their mental health situations. And we all know that if you, if you don't face a situation and try to tackle it head on, sometimes with the help of real friends and great people, it's not going to go away, it's just going to get worse. And what we have now in our culture is a situation where people can more easily hide it. And that's very unhealthy. Paul tells men to care for their wives the same way they would treat their own bodies. And now we find ourselves in a time where the mental health of our society is lower than ever. How is a man to treat his wife as good as he treats his own body if he views his body as not worthy? The mental health crisis that Twangy is talking about is in the middle of ushering itself in as we speak. And it's harmful to people and to marriages. Let's recognize the situation, and instead of making the stigma that shames people, let's rally around them and support them in real ways like Jesus would. We need to make sure that when people have mental health crises or situations, that we're not making them feel like they're crazy. They aren't. They're facing real life. And we as the church have to do a good job of coming around people and loving them through that situation, not pushing them off to the side and disregarding what they have to do. The third situation I want to talk about is unmarried peoples. And as I said earlier, these, these are heavy topics that we don't have a ton of time to go into today, but I want to continue this conversation throughout the week. So as we dive into this third section, realize that this is a conversation that doesn't need to end here. Actually, I would love having conversations with people throughout this week and evermore. Talk about is unmarried people. And, and I thought about unmarried peoples as, as three distinct categories. There's probably more, but I thought about them as three distinct categories. And, and, and please forgive these rudimentary names, but, but here's what those three categories are. The first category is singles. These are people who haven't been married. They're in search of marriage. They, most of them are young. Most are young, but not all of them. But they're in search of marriage. They're singles. The second category or, that I thought about as unmarried peoples is the recovering group. This is a group of people seeking life after marriage. Their marriage may have ended either through divorce or, or maybe the loss of their husband to wife. They've been a part of what they thought was going to be a happily ever after, only to find themselves hurt, broken, and alone, wondering if Jesus can love them now that they have a failed marriage or a lost marriage. Just be sure of this. Jesus does love you. Jesus loves you so, so much. I mean, don't we believe in redemption? The third group is, I call untraditional. 
And the untraditional people are typically people from the LGBTQ community. And just so I can be clear about this, Jesus loves you too. The church must do a better job showing each of these groups of people the love of Jesus. There are people that believe and think the love of Jesus can't be shared with these people groups. And I can assure you that the love of Jesus covers each and every one of these people the same way it covers you and me. It's important to realize that. And it's also important to note that the truth of the Bible does not have to be compromised to love those people. That's really, really important. You can love people in a biblical way and adhere to biblical truth at the same time. Jesus did it. I think it's important to note that singles ministries shouldn't be ministries that people go to to get married off. That's not why singles ministries should exist. That doesn't mean you can't find a spouse and fall in love in a group of singles. But the singles ministry should exist to help young people follow Jesus and grow deeper into a relationship with Him. That's why singles ministries should exist. And if we only look at it as a speed dating round, we're losing something big. Recovering people shouldn't feel shame about a failed marriage. Don't believe, don't believe that Jesus can't redeem a person. We've all been redeemed. And it's important that when we believe in Jesus and put our faith in him and choose to pick up our cross and follow him, we are redeemed. I've talked to people who have gone through divorce and they don't come to church because they feel uncomfortable. They don't feel welcomed. They don't feel welcome because Jesus is, or because divorce is a sin. And, and I'm not quoting that because I don't think that in many cases divorce is a sin. But there are also many cases where divorce isn't a sin. Jesus talked about that. But if sinners aren't allowed in church, then I gotta go. Because I too am a sinner. Church isn't meant to be a, a club for saints, it's meant to be a lifeboat for sinners. That's what church is supposed to be. Jesus didn't come here not to save the lost. He came specifically for the lost. He came specifically for the sinner. And speaking of sin, can we please stop pretending that people in the LGBTQ community sin worse than those outside that community? Can we please stop thinking that their sin is worse than mine or ours? I started this really cool book this past week called Costly Obedience. And in this book, it's a, it's, it's a longevity study. As you can tell from my choice of books today, I'm kind of a nerd. But this book in longevity study, it, it's a really neat book, and, it, and I've only glossed through it really quickly. I'm going to go back and read this deeply, but in a grossly understated summation of this book, this book talks about Christians whose sexual orientation fall into the LGBTQT community. They have same-sex attraction or something along those lines, but they love Jesus so much, they choose to be celibate. They choose not to engage in those relationships they know Jesus would approve of. Yet, many of those people who are living in costly obedience don't feel welcome at church because they feel judged. There's a good argument to be made for these people that are living in this costly obedience are sacrificing more than any of us. They love Jesus enough to put across their attraction that the culture says is just normal and they should live into. But they are obedient to Jesus. And we should work hard to make them not just feel welcomed here, but maybe learn a little bit of what it means to sacrifice. Compass, let's be a church that shows people that Jesus loves everybody without compromising timeless truth of Scripture. We can do it. We should do it. Last service, I just had a conversation with someone who talked about it. She said, she said, thank you for having that conversation. I've never quite felt welcome. She said, you are here, and you're loved. Let's talk more. I'd love to hear more about your story. As we close this passage, I want to read these last three verses, 31 through 33. It says this. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and, to the, and the two shall become one flesh. That's, that's God's idea of what marriage is. So if you're going to engage marriage, there it is. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I found it interesting there, I'm going off on this, but it's, I think it's really neat, that it says that a husband should love his wife, but a wife should respect her husband. And that's not saying that those are two very dissimilar ideas. But men and women accept love differently. They feel loved and valued differently. Men and women are different. And so it's interesting that Paul says men should love their wives and women should respect their husbands. The ultimate purpose of marriage is to glorify God. And it's true that there are other ways to glorify God. We should glorify God through our entire life, before or during marriage. If we're not married, that doesn't mean we shouldn't glorify God. We should be glorifying God with our life all the time. I was once told that our culture prioritizes things upside down. And I heard it, and I thought to myself, well, that sounds strange. Let, let me hear more about that. And the person I was talking to said, this culture values kids above marriage, and it values marriage above God. In other words, I'm going to do whatever I can for my kids, and then when I have time, I'll build into my marriage. And I'll do whatever it does, takes to go through those two things, and when I have time, maybe I'll go to church or, or, or pray or read the Bible. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. And what I realized was, kids don't build into marriages. They actually put stress on them. Let's be honest. And marriages don't build into Christ. He's already perfect. So if we prioritize things, kids, marriage, and God, we're not doing it in a way that can fill up one another. God can fill up your marriage. So we put God first, marriage can be filled up and blessed and built. And if we put marriage before kids, well, our marriage can build into our kids. Hey, let me tell you from experience what no kid wants, a broken marriage. No kid wants that. That doesn't mean they don't happen and there's not differences that can't be repaired. But no kid wants that. So let's get our priorities in place. Put God first so he can build into your marriage. Let your marriage build into your kids. And let's glorify God and show Jesus to an unbelieving world in a way that people can't deny. Let's pray. Oh my goodness, God. <clears throat> God, i got to be honest, this is the second time we've had this talk, and it's still not easy. There's still so much here. Lord, I want to thank you first for sharing timeless wisdom with us, that even though our culture says it's not applicable today, is. Because you know us, you love us, you redeem us, and know what's best for us. God, thank you so much for allowing us to seek you first. And Lord, knowing that, that allows us to build our marriages up if we're married. And that will allow us to build into our kids. Lord, I specifically want to thank you for opening our eyes, mine specifically, to see that this passage speaks to so many more people than just the married ones. That although this subtitle is Husbands and Wives, there's so much we can learn no matter where we are in our life, in our faith walk, that we can look at this and apply it to our lives today in this culture. And Lord, as much as it seems like it is against culture, it's a breath of fresh air. It's so wonderful to know that Jesus is personal and that he blesses marriage and he builds it up. He builds us up as individuals and as couples. And Jesus, your love is real. God, I thank you for that. And as we move forward, God, I pray for Compass in all the churches, in Bend, in Central Oregon, and in all of Oregon, the world, that we can really lean into your truth and your love at the same time. That we can be a church that shows people love without compromising truth. That we don't use truth as a hammer, but we love first. And never forget the truth. Jesus, we love you and you lift this up in your name. Amen.